The 1900s marked the end of an age of innocence and the beginning of an age of innovation, unlike any known to man. The 20th century began with the passing of a monarch who had given her name to an era, Queen Victoria. Across the seas, America lost its leader, President McKinley, to an assassin's bullet and welcomed his successor, Theodore Roosevelt. Although most of the world enjoyed the turn of the century calm, several hot spots flared around the globe. The Boxer Rebellion in China, the Boer War in South Africa, and the Russo-Japanese War in Asia. In San Francisco, a devastating earthquake destroyed the city and shocked the world. The beginning of the 20th century also saw the introduction of amazing new inventions like that newfangled gadget, the automobile and flickering images on a screen. And most unbelievable of all, a machine that let men fly like birds. The 1900s opened the door to the modern age and an extraordinary century of discovery. February 8th, 1900. The Eastman Kodak Company introduces a simple cardboard box camera to the world called the Brownie. Named after elf characters from a popular series of children's books, the Brownie makes taking pictures easy. So easy, even children can take a charming photograph. In the beginning, photographic procedure had been costly, cumbersome, and complicated. A series of inventions simplified picture taking, but the Brownie was the first inexpensive, easy to use camera. Anyone could click and take a picture. Back in 1839, French inventor Louis Daguerre discovered that mercury vapors could develop an image from a sensitized plate exposed to light. His daguerreotypes launched the age of photography and quickly became a sensation. Unlike paintings or lithographs, a daguerreotype was an exact likeness of the subject. To record themselves for posterity, thousands of individuals and their families sat for the camera. But daguerreotypes were no quick and simple snapshot. They were one-of-a-kind positive images that could not produce multiple pictures. To prepare the silver-coated copper sheets, load the camera, and develop the plate required skill, patience, and hours of labor. The poor person who sat for the portrait had to hold a pose for up to 20 minutes, his head affixed to clamps. Any movement caused a blur. No wonder the subject never risked the torture of holding a 20-minute smile. By mid-century, a new photographic process was invented, the collodion or wet plate process, which produced a negative and so an unlimited number of prints. Glass plates were replaced with tin, a cheaper and stronger material, and the resulting prints were called tintypes. Tintypes were less costly than daguerreotypes, and soon tent businesses sprang up near beaches and carnivals. Inside each tent, photographers coated their plates with a wet, gluey collodion, took their picture in the sunlight, then quickly developed the exposed wet plate before it dried. In 1860, a photographer named Matthew Brady opened a gallery in New York City and began taking portraits of well-known subjects like presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln. Brady sold thousands of prints of this popular photograph. Then, when the Civil War broke out, Brady sent teams of photographers to the battlefields to document for the public the first grim scenes of war. Not far from the cannon fire of Bull Run, Antietam, and Appomattox, Brady parked his wagons, the mobile dark rooms, where he prepared and developed his wet plates. His exposure times were short, only fractions of a minute, but still too long to capture action. So he selected scenes and subjects able to hold a pose, usually before or after a battle. By the end of the war, men like Matthew Brady's assistant, Timothy O'Sullivan, turned to the west and began taking exquisite landscape photographs. Then, in 1871, 
With the discovery of gelatin and the dry plate process, photographers no longer had to travel with dark rooms, but developed their plates hours, even days after taking a picture. The dry plate was so light sensitive, it required a mere fraction of a second exposure and could capture action. George Eastman was a bank clerk and an amateur photographer in Rochester, New York in 1880 when he began to manufacture and sell dry plates. But he was put off by the large cameras and the tedious development process. In the interest of enticing non-professionals, Eastman made it his mission to build a simple, affordable camera. His first innovation was rolled paper negative film. Then, in 1888, he developed a box camera, the Kodak, a name he chose because it was short and could not be mispronounced. Portable, easier to use than anything before, the Kodak took what Eastman called snapshots. His customers sent their cameras to Eastman's factory in Rochester, where the film was unloaded, developed, and printed. Then the camera was reloaded and returned to its owner ready for use. But the Kodak was only the start. At $25, it was not accessible to most consumers. Eastman was determined to build a camera suitable for mass production. In February 1900, the Brownie was unveiled, a cardboard box with a wooden film carrier. At a price of only $1, the Brownie was advertised to attract children whom Eastman shrewdly knew would soon grow up to buy cameras and, of course, film. To reach the younger users, Eastman displayed his modest little box with brownie elves from the pages of popular storybooks by Palmer Cox. Plant the brownie acorn, Eastman said, and the Kodak oak will grow. And grow it did. On the first run, the Rochester plant turned out 5,000 brownies, and they sold immediately. 10, then 20,000 more were built, and shops could not keep them stocked. The brownie found its way into millions of households, and through the years until the 1980s, Kodak released nearly 100 different models under the brownie name. George Eastman had built a reliable, inexpensive camera even children could use. And many a successful photographer today attributes his start to the Kodak Brownie.